Uh, my name's uh, Bill Simon. I'm actually an ordained reverend on the block here in Redfern. I, I give uh, communion, I can do uh, marriages, I can do funeral services. And uh, I go into Long Bay Jail and marry guys in there, uh, married white businessmen under the Harbour Bridge, and I've done all that. I've married people here on the block, actually. Looking back onto where I came from, I'm Burupai, that means I was, uh, I'm the Shark tribe. I was born up in Tari, Perfilip, uh Mission. At a very, very young there when I started to get the, to know my roots around that area. What happened was at Perfleet Mission, you weren't allowed to leave the mission unless you got permission uh, from the, from the uh, manager. Uh, even to go in town and things like that, you see. Uh, all of the rations were rationed out to us, uh, to mum and dad, and uh, they used to go down and get rations there, like flour and tea and sugar and stuff like that. But mum and dad apparently didn't like that sort of regime, so they, uh, they just took us one night. They took us to a little place called Kendall. That's about halfway between Tari and Kempsey. We stayed there for a, for a good while, I suppose about 12 months or so. Uh, we used to go to the beach and uh, Nan would take us down here and get all these shells and make hearts and put velvet on the inside of them and sprinkle sand around the around them with all these shells placed around, beautiful shells placed around and she'd give it to us kids and we'd go and sell them so that we get enough to get bread and a uh, bit of bread and sugar and tea and stuff like that, you know, we loved that. Uh, we used to go and pinch all some uh, <laughs> persimmons and pears and all that off our neighbours and we loved that too, you know, as kids growing up. The welfare caught up with us here after about 12 months and mum and dad left again and went to a little place called Platts Estate Waratah where I grew up. And it's beautiful there as well. I got to know a lot of uh, the community guys. The man that owned uh, that section of land, uh, he wrote in his will that anybody who needed a place to stay were, were allowed to stay there free of rent. I didn't know that. I learned all this later on as I grew up, of course. And uh, so that's where a lot of the people who ran away from their own various communities uh, missions and, and stuff like that, they'd all come there and they all lived together, that's how we became a community there. I got to know a lot of the, um, a lot of my relations, a lot of friends. Uh, there was white people there as well as Aboriginal people and uh, other cultures as well, so we all grew up together there, like a multicultural uh, place. Things went good for us here until, of course, the welfare came. They used to sit up on top of a hill with spy glasses and watch down on the shacks. We had a little tin shack down there. The elders used to say to us every time the welfare or the police came, we were to run and hide in the bushes, which we did. But of course, with this time, when I got caught, we didn't uh, we didn't hear them or see them or anything. They were sitting and with spy glasses watching our house. When Dad went to work, as soon as Dad went over the hill. They swooped down, came in, knocked on the door real loudly and, and then sort of pushed their way in. And mum was there with, with me and my three little brothers. One of them was just a baby. And they came in and, and they told mum to uh, pass the kids up and, and uh, pass a little baby up and give them to me so that I, I can go out in the car and sit in the car and wait for them. And my other two brothers had to follow me. We all sat in the car there and I'm crying out. I screamed out real loud to mum to come and help us. And she looked around and then she turned her back and walked inside and straight away then I felt rejected by my own mother, by my own people and, and the cry of my heart, you know, it, it, it made me that, that angry because no one was there to help me. I was only thinking about me and my three little brothers all crying and crying out for mum and dad and that was the last time I ever, ever seen dad, we never seen dad again, he died. I didn't see my mother until years later, till I was about in my late 20s, going off the early 30s, you see. My youngest brother didn't come. We dropped him off at Tari because he was too young. They sent him to a baby's home. We never seen him till a couple of years later on. And uh, being brought up under this kind of a regime, uh, with people telling you what to do all the time and if you spoke back you got flogged and you got beaten and 
and there, there was a lot of that that was going on in the boys' home at the time that I was there for the eight, uh, eight or nine years that I was in the home as a kid, you know, growing up. Uh, the white staff, who were all ex-army personnel, uh, they used to tell us that our people were no good, they didn't want us, they didn't care for us, and not getting a visit for nine years as a kid, growing up you start to believe that, so I was brainwashed in that area. Uh, you know, I've, I've made two videos which goes around to the universities called Whitewash, just how I was brainwashed under the white man system. We were told what to do, when to do it and how to do it and everything else and that's all we were told to do. I was given a number, 33, and they called me by that for, for eight years, not my name, and uh, we were beaten, flogged and molested and everything else, but we couldn't tell anybody because nobody was allowed to come visit us in arms. So we were just little kids who were flogged, beaten, sent up the line. Everyone had hit you, about 100 guys had hit you. Uh, if you'd done anything wrong, the, one of the worst main of, offences was to speak back to the white staff. If you'd done that, you were sent up the line. The, you'd get a beating. By the time you got to the end of the line, there'd be blood everywhere, and they put you in a little toilet, uh, a storeroom, and fed you on bread and water for three days. We were kids. Who could we tell, you know? Couldn't tell anybody. They knew where we were, right, but they weren't allowed to come and visit us. So all this time, all this rejection was building up in my heart. I remembered that I had a grandmother who used to come and visit me and my three little brothers while we were in the boys' home. Beautiful, lovely person she was, uh, and yet nobody else was allowed in, into the home, you see, but yet I'm sure God, God gave her the keys to get in, you see, because she used to come and they'd let her in. And she'd pray for us, and oh, she was lovely. So by the time I got out, uh, about 17, and I came down the, down the uh, Redfern here, I came down to Heavily Street looking for my, uh, my Aboriginal families because I didn't know any of them. But I was taken away, I, I lost all contact with, with my family, you know. When I did eventually come in into Redfern, I found out that all these wild blackfellas were my uncles and aunts and cousins and relations. <laughs> they told me where my mother was. She was right out in Dubbo, at Wellington. And so I went all the way out to Wellington to see my mum for the first time since I was locked up. But the, the distance was far too great because that relationship between a mother and a son was too far, too far gone. I, I didn't see my mum as mum. You know what I mean? Because I still had a lot of hurt and hate against her for not coming to see me and visit me in the arms. I didn't know about her side of the story, if you know what I mean, about uh, it felt like a knife driven through her heart when us kids were taken from her. I never even thought of that. But uh, so the distance seems to be too great. And of course we, we, we hugged and that and kissed and, and, and I went and had a drink with my uncles for the first time and took me out to Galar Gumbo. It's the first time I ever got on methylated spirits. And so I started to drink methylated spirits a lot because it was cheap. It was a cheap drink and you could have a good fight afterwards and you wouldn't feel anything. So you get a good fight in the drink, you drink metho, you see. And all the kids that I grew up with in them times. I was all very, very mixed up in my heart. I didn't trust anybody. I got in, uh, locked up when I was 18 years of age and sent out to Long Bay Jail. And, uh, it was very hard and rough out there as well, but it was just like the boy's arm, so it, did, it really didn't worry me because I felt like that I was home again when I went to jail, you see. It's the same thing happens in the boy's arm. We were given numbers. And the, have a guess what the number they gave me when I first went to Long Bay Jail when I was 18. Have a guess. The same, 33. When I did five years in prison, uh, I speak to a lot of the brothers in there who were in the homes with me, the stolen mob, you know. And uh, they say, how you going? They all know me because they know my testimony of how I've changed my life and that. And I don't preach to them. Uh, all I tell them is, is uh, that this is how God cleaned my life up and things like that. Um, and there are a lot of them there that come up to me, ask me to pray for them, which I do. And uh, I pray for them. They go out three months later, they're back again doing the same thing. Because well, I've done a lot of uh, time in prison and, and in the prison system, once they get out, the community on the outside has, hasn't got any backup uh, to look after the inmates that have been put inside after a long period of time, then they're let out. Out here, it's a foreign world to them. In, in jail, uh, you get everything, you get things, you're catered for 24-7, you see. 
all you have to do is get up and do a bit of work here and there, and, and now go and have your meal, then you can go and have a sleep. That's how the, uh, you institutionalise, that's how it works. See, I'm used to that because that's what happened to the boys' home to us. And a lot of these guys, when they get out, like when I got out of the boys' home, I didn't know where to go or what to do or anything else. I didn't know anything about the world. And the same as these guys, when they're put in prison, once they get out, they're going to need a lot more support, love, care and attention and guidance and, and point in the right direction to go for their lives because they don't know all that. They're not taught that in jail, you see. When I got out, we, I still didn't feel as if I was free because we didn't know anywhere, anywhere else to go in Sydney. We didn't know where, where to go or anything like that, so we just stayed at home. Because that's all we did at the boys' home, we stayed at home, you see. So we really didn't get much of a contact with people at all. The only blokes that I, I seem to have any contact with were bikies. I can't, don't want to mention their names, but uh, there's a big gang that I end up getting, uh, getting to know because these guys uh, were the more or less the same as me because they're rejected as well. And that rejection part of it comes in when you're, you're rejected by society. Seemed to come together, you know, and these bodies were rejected. So I, I felt at home with them. You know, we had guns and all that. We'd go around terrorising everyone, and I thought, great, right at home. We'd go up the cross, terrorise everyone up there, about 60 of us. And I went back to uh, Newcastle, uh, where Mum and them eventually came. A lot of my people come from Newcastle, the Simons. And uh, I ended up mixing up there with the wrong crowd. I had my own drug little scheme running there. I used to sell a lot of drugs. and. Uh, get into fights, had my own gang, a lot of them sort of, um, they all came around me, a lot of the young boys in them days, I'm talking about when we had the riots and all that in Hunter Street, Newcastle, I had, had my own gang, I spent time in jail, I knew how to king it, I learned how to king it when I was in jail, and once you uh, learn how to king it, it never leaves you. So that's why I, I, I used to win all my fights, because I used to king it, bang, it'd be over in the first hit, that way I grabbed a gathering of people around me, young guys and all that, with leather jackets and stuff like that. Most of them carried guns and everything else. We ended up joining up with the uh, underworld in Newcastle. I did something wrong with them guys and they turned around and put two contracts out of my life. And because uh, my cousin who did 25 years jail, uh, he went and seen him and, and got it put off me because they seemed to take notice of him because he's done two murders himself, you see. And uh, that's the kind of group people that I started to affiliate with because I still had a lot of hate against uh, my own my own people, black folks, because I blame them for sending me away, not coming to uh, get me and see me and that. And therefore that rejection stuck with me. I hated my mum and I blamed her. I blamed all the black fellas for not coming to help me, for putting me away as a kid growing up. I wasn't thinking about the pain and the heartache that would have happened to mum because uh, my wife's a counsellor and she counselled mum at one stage and a counsellor seemed to keep things out of you that you keep hidden inside, you know. And she got it out of mum and, and mum told her that when us four kids were taken from her, it was like a knife driven through her heart and she couldn't stand to watch so she turned around and went inside. This is what the government oh, yeah. thinks that they are doing the right thing at the time and they, you know, praise the Lord, good on them. But it wasn't the right thing. Well, the government thinks that we were taken because we were neglected. That's what they say in my report. I've read my report right through, and it's all lies, of course, because I, I, I was taken care of by my family, by my mum, by my dad, and we, I had the best life in all my life until I was taken away. And when I, became, when I was taken away, my life had never turned bad and rotten until then. That's why I ended up joining up with biking, being with the underworld, with the wrong crowds and things like that. It, it never, ever, uh, that would never have happened if I would have stayed at my, uh, with my family. I was so hurt and broken. I had so much aggressive, I mean, I've had contracts lifted off my life and, uh, and I've been so violent myself. That, uh, I had five relationships with women. The first wife that I had, I used to give her two black eyes. The second wife, I knocked her teeth out. The third wife, I broke her leg, just crushed it with my hands.
because I was very strong in the hands. I used to hit me man and wrestle a lot. But I had so much hurt and, and, and that inside of my heart uh, that uh, I, I was just so, so uh, bad. And that's why these uh, women left me, you know. But as soon as I got converted to Christianity, when cry, ask Christ to come into my heart, uh, I wrote them letters and apologised to them. When my conversion comes into uh, in, into a focus, uh, it's how I turn around and forgave uh, the black man and forgave the white man and got on with my life. And God is starting to heal me now because I turned around and forgave. I would never have uh, asked for forgiveness if, if Christ Jesus hadn't come into my heart. If you put scalding hot water on a, on a child, you're going to scar them for life. You see, and that's what happens when we were taken away as kids. We were scarred for life by what by being ripped away from our parents and our loved ones. We were scarred for life. And there's no way we can get a healing out of that. You see, only God can heal us, of course, you know, from the deep hurts and the pains that's inside of us. Look, I felt so bad against people, against authority. I didn't trust anybody because I, could, I didn't know any, anybody who turned around uh, and could show us any love, uh, like a mother's love or a father. Father's love, you know, we, we missed out on all that. Uh, weren't allowed to speak any, any uh, Aboriginal uh, culture, uh, language, because I didn't know it, because I was taken away at an early age. And so I really lost just about everything. Yeah, I lost my family, we lost everything.